Today, we're looking at section 2.4, and section 2.4 is about measures of variation. So knowing where the middle of a data set falls can be very useful. That's what we went over in section 2.3. But knowing how that data varies can be equally as important. And the simplest of all measures of variation that we have is the range. So what is the range? The range is the difference between the maximum and minimum data values. So we can write that as range equals max value minus min value. But the thing about the range is it only gives you an idea of the spread of the data set, how much space it takes up on the number line from lowest to highest, but it doesn't tell you how the numbers are spread out in that region. So it's kind of minimally important when we talk about the range. We have a note. The note is that the range is the numerator of the class width formula. So if you remember when we were finding frequency distributions and we had to identify the class width, that was max minus min over the number of classes, while the max minus the min is the class range. So another way to think of that value is it's the class range divided by the number of classes. So the next measurement that we have relates the spread of the data to its center, and it's called the deviation of a data entry. So what the deviation is, it's the difference between that data entry and the mean of the data set. It's the deviation of x equals x minus mu. That's if it's a population. If we're talking about a sample, then the deviation of x is x minus x bar. So what the deviation does is it tells you the distance between each data value and the mean. How far away from the mean is that particular data value? So here's an example. Find the deviations for this population data set. We have 30, 30, 32, 33, 34, 34, 35, 35, 35, 35, 36, 38, 41, 41, 41, 42, 44, 46, 46, 47, 54, 56, 56, 60, and 69. So our solution here is to first find the mean because we can't compute a deviation if we don't know the mean of the data set. So to find the mean, we're gonna add up all these numbers there's 25 of them. So if we add up all 25 of these numbers, they add up to 1,050. To find the mean, and we know it's gonna be a mu here because it says it's a population, mu is gonna be 1050 divided by 25. 1050 divided by 25 is 42. So the mean of this population data set is 42. To find the deviations, it might be good to build a table so that we can keep track of each data value and its deviation. So in this table, I've listed all of the data values, all 25 of them, and then I've left a blank space in a column for the deviations. And to find each deviation, I'm just gonna take the data value and subtract the mean. So specifically in this problem, we'll be subtracting 42 because 42 is the mean. So 30 minus 42 is negative 12. That happens again here, we get another negative 12. 32 minus 42 is negative 10. 33 minus 42 is negative 9. 34 minus 42 is negative 8. 34 minus 42 again is negative 8. 35 minus 42 is negative 7, and then that happens three more times. 36 minus 42 is negative 6. 38 minus 42 is negative 4. 41 minus 42 is negative 1, and it happens again and again. 42 minus 42 is 0. 44 minus 42 is 2. 46 minus 42 is 4. And again, 47 minus 42 is 5, 54 minus 42 is 12, 
56 minus 42 is 14, and we get another 14. 60 minus 42 is 18, and 69 minus 42 is 27. So we've computed the 25 deviations. Now, these deviations show you how each individual data entry is related to the mean. So, for instance, the deviation of 32 equals negative 10 means that 32 is 10 units less than the mean. Remember, the mean was 42, and by saying this deviation was negative 10, that's telling you that the value is less than the mean by 10 spaces. The deviation for 54 is positive 12. That means that 54 is 12 more than the mean. So when you see negative deviations, the data values are less than the mean. When you see positive deviations, the data values are greater than the mean. Now, if we add up these values, something pretty interesting occurs. Negative 12 plus negative 12 plus negative 10. Negative 9 plus negative 8 plus negative 8 plus negative 7 plus negative 7 plus negative 7 equals negative 80. Negative 7 plus negative 6 plus negative 4 plus negative 1 plus negative 1 plus negative 1 plus 0 plus 2 plus 4 equals negative 14. And 4 plus 5 plus 12 plus 14 plus 14 plus 18 plus 27 equals 94. If we take those values, negative 80 plus negative 14 plus 94, which were our three sums, and add them together, we get zero. And we have a little note. The sum of all deviations in a data set is always zero. So no matter what data set you have, if you found every deviation and added them all up, it would always come out to zero. So we'd like to be able to compute the average of the deviations. What that would tell us is about how far we would expect a random data value to be from the mean. Just a randomly chosen data value. How far on average would that be from the mean? So there's a big problem with us doing this. Do you know what that problem is? Right, think about what we've talked about. Can you see what the problem is? And the problem is that to find an average, any average, you have to add up all the deviations for the data values and divide by the total number of entries. In this case, when we add up all the deviations, we get zero. It always comes out zero. So the average would have to be zero. But we know that's not right because all of these data values except for one had some distance that they were from zero. So the average distance shouldn't be zero. So there must be something going on here. And the real problem with this is that the deviations are not a true measurement of distance. Because distance is always positive. It's not possible for a person to walk negative 10 feet. They can walk 10 feet in the other direction, but they can't walk negative 10 feet. So when we look at our deviations and some of them are positive, some of them are negative, the negative ones are not really giving us a true idea of distance. So we have to take care of that negativity problem some way. We have to come up with a way around that problem, and that's going to be the standard deviation. So to be able to compute a standard deviation, we need another value first that's called the variance. And when we compute the variance, it turns out there's two slightly different formulas. We have a separate formula for when we're taking a population variance and when we're taking a sample variance. So let's take a look at the variance. The variance is a value computed to help us find the standard deviation. And in general, when you compute the units, those units don't mean anything. So for instance, if all of your data values were in seconds, when we go to find the variance, the units would turn into square seconds. And square seconds really doesn't mean anything. It doesn't make much sense. So those units would be meaningless. But we do need the value that's computed. We just don't care about the units when we're computing the variance. To find the variance, we're going to use one of these two formulas. 
the population variance formula is that sigma squared is equal to the sum of the x minus mu squared over capital N. And the sample variance formula is that s squared is equal to the sum of x minus x bar squared over n minus 1. So if you inspect these formulas, you see that the numerator of the population variance formula has x minus mu, and the numerator of the sample variance formula has x minus x bar. Well, those are the deviations, right? x minus mu was the deviation for population values. x minus x bar was the deviation for sample values. And we're squaring those. Why are we squaring them? The reason that we're squaring them is because when you square a number, it makes it positive. So this takes care of that negativity problem that we were talking about. And in this case, the capital N is the number of entries in the population. The lowercase n is the number of entries in the sample. And x minus mu and x minus x bar are the deviations of the data. So basically what we're doing is we're finding all of the deviations, squaring them, and then adding them all up. Once you've got this sum, you're going to divide by some value that's related to the population or sample size. So in the case of the population, you divide by the size of the population. In the case of the sample, you divide by one less than the sample size. Once we know the variance, finding the standard deviation is pretty simple. And again, we have two different formulas. Since we have two different formulas for variance, there will be two different formulas for the standard deviation. So the standard deviation is a value that measures the typical amount an entry deviates from the mean. Most of the work that we need to find the standard deviation is all wrapped up in finding the variance. So once you can find the variance, standard deviation is actually very quick and simple. To find the standard deviation, we want to use one of these formulas. For the population standard deviation, sigma is equal to the square root of the sum of x minus mu squared over n. And for the sample standard deviation, s is equal to the square root of the sum of x minus x bar squared over n minus 1. And again, capital N is the number of entries in the population. Lowercase n is the number of entries in the sample. And x minus mu, or x minus x bar, are the deviations of the data. So what did we do to the variance? We took the square root. That's how we find the standard deviation once we know the variance, is we take the square root. So the standard deviation is always the square root of the variance. That's our next note. And that's going to be true in this section and in every other section that we do. We're going to learn other formulas for standard deviation of other types of data gathering mechanisms. But whatever we do, once we find a variance, the standard deviation will always be the square root of the variance. So this is how we get around that problem of deviations adding up to zero. The reason that it happened were that some were positive, some were negative, and they all ended up canceling each other out. In the standard deviation, we square those deviations, and that turns them positive. And once they're positive, we add them all together, and we take the square root to get back to our original values. So square roots are also positive valued, so that gets rid of that negativity problem for us. At least that's kind of the basic idea. There's more to it than that, but we're just going to kind of go with that. We have an example. Consider this population data set. We have 20 numbers here. 43, 48, 48, 49, 50, 51, 53, 55, 57, 58, 60, 60, 62, 65, 68, 68, 70, 70, 71, 74. Let's find the standard deviation. So to start this process, we would have to find the variance. Well, to find the variance, 
we need the deviations. To find the deviations, we need the mean. So we're going to start by finding the mean mu. Add up all these data values. They add up to 1,180. And we divide by 20. And 1,180 divided by 20 is 59. So we have a population average of 59. Next, we're going to build a table to compute each of the deviations and their squares. So in this table, I've listed all 20 data values along with a column for the deviations, x minus mu, and then another column for the squares of the deviations, because it's those squares that we actually need to compute the standard deviation. So we found out that our mean was 59, so our first deviation, 43 minus 59, is negative 16. 48 minus 59 is negative 11, and then we get negative 11 again. 49 minus 59 is negative 10. 50 minus 59 is negative 9. 51 minus 59 is negative 8. 53 minus 59 is negative 6. 55 minus 59 is negative 4. 57 minus 59 is negative 2. 58 minus 59 is negative 1. 60 minus 59 is in positive 1 and we get positive 1 again. 62 minus 59 is 3. 65 minus 59 is 6. 68 minus 59 is 9. And we get 9 again. 70 minus 59 is 11. And we get 11 again. 71 minus 59 is 12. 74 minus 59 is 15. So now we have our 20 deviation values. Again, if we added these up, they would add up to zero. So to solve that problem, we're going to square each one of these. So we're going to take the negative 16 and square it. That gives us 256. Negative 11 squared is 121. 121 again. Negative 10 squared is 100. Negative 9 squared is 81. Negative 8 squared is 64. Negative 6 squared is 36. Negative 4 squared is 16. Negative 2 squared is 4. Negative 1 squared is 1. 1 squared is 1. 1 squared is 1. 3 squared is 9. 6 squared is 36. 9 squared is 81. 9 squared again is 81. 11 squared is 121. 11 squared again is 121, 12 squared is 144, and 15 squared is 225. So now we have these 20 squared deviation values. According to our formula, we're supposed to add those up. So if we add up the 256, 121, 121, 181, 64, 36, 16, 4, and 1 from the first column, we get a sum of 800. If we add up the second column values, which are 1, 1, 9, 36, 81, 81, 121, 121, 144, and 225, that column adds up to 820. So we add these together, 800 plus 820 is 1620. So that's the sum of the squares of the deviations. To find the variance, we take that sum, 1620, and divide it by the size of the population, which was 20. 1620 divided by 20 is 81. So the variance in this problem is 81. To find the standard deviation, we take the square root of the variance. So the square root of 81 is 9. So the standard deviation for this problem is 9. So on average, these data values vary from the mean by about 9 units. So another example. Just a question. What would we have done differently if the previous data set was a sample instead of a population? So we were looking at it as a population, but what if it had been a sample? Well, everything at the beginning would have been the same. We would have still found the mean, 
we would have found it exactly the same way. We would have called it x bar instead of mu, but the value would have still been 59. Then we would have found the deviations the same way. We would subtract each data value and the mean. We would call it x minus x bar instead of x minus mu, but the values in the table would be the same. We would then square each one of those deviations and get the same square values, and we would add them all up the same way. The difference comes when we divide, because when we find the variance for a sample, we're not dividing by the size of the sample, we're dividing by n minus 1. So in this case, we'd be dividing by 19 instead of 20, because 20 minus 1 would give us 19. So this would be 1620 over 19 for the variance, and when we take the square root of 1620 over 19, this is 9.234. Now you'll notice I left the fraction 1620 over 19 underneath the square root. Your calculators are capable of taking the square root of a fraction. What we don't want to do is to divide that out on the calculator, 1620 divided by 19, and get a value that's a decimal, and then round that off and take the square root of that. We don't want to round off in the middle of a problem. So that brings us to our next note. When computing a value like this, only round off once at the very end. Never round off in an intermediate step. That's what's called the propagation of error. Once you round a value off, it's not quite right. If you use that value to compute another value, then that value is not quite right. If you round off again, that makes it even more incorrect, more imprecise. And if you keep using these values to compute subsequent values and you keep rounding, then all of a sudden your answer is very far off from what it should be if you used exact values all along the way. So just remember, never round off in an intermediate step. So what is the standard deviation? We've got a formula for it. We've mentioned that it's kind of this average distance. But what the standard deviation really is about it's a measurement of the spread of a data set. If you have data values that are tightly grouped together, so there's not much difference between those numbers, then that data set will have a very small standard deviation. When you have widely dispersed, very spread out data, that data will have a large standard deviation. So if we look at a couple of different data sets here, both of which have the mean of eight, here are their histograms. Which one do you think has the smallest standard deviation? And can you explain your answer? So when we look at these, they have the same average. They would both have an average of 8. But one of them has a smaller standard deviation than the other. Which one has the smallest standard deviation? And the answer here is that the second graph, the one with its highest bar in the middle, has the smallest standard deviation. The reason for that is if we look at the data values in that second graph, the height of the bar means there's a lot more data values there. So this has a lot of its data values close to the mean of 8. In the other graph, it has its shortest bar at 8, and the bars get taller the farther we get away. That means that we have a lot of data values that are far away from the mean, and not as many that are close. So in the first graph, we have a lot of data values that are far away from the mean, and very few that are close, which means we have a lot of spread. In the second group, we have a lot of values that are near the mean, with very few that are far away. So that means this data is more tightly packed together. You get more data closer to the mean, which makes it have a smaller standard deviation. So that's how the standard deviation can help us tell the difference between data sets. When we have a tightly packed group of data, then that's going to have a small standard deviation. When we have a widely dispersed set of data, then we're going to have a larger standard deviation. All right, so let's talk about something called the empirical rule. The empirical rule is a way that we can use this idea of standard deviation to help us get an idea 
of how many data values should be within a certain distance of the mean. So frequently data sets can be graphically described as a bell curve. When this occurs, there's a rule that expresses how much data can be found within certain ranges of the mean. So it's the empirical rule. What the empirical rule says is that within one standard deviation of the mean, 68% of all data values are found. Within two standard deviations of the mean, you'll find 95% of all data values. And within three standard deviations of the mean, you'll find 99.7% of all data values. That means that only 0.3% of data values are beyond three standard deviations from the mean. We can use that, and this graph kind of demonstrates that idea. We can use that to help us answer questions. What you'll notice here on this graph is that we have the mean right here in the middle. Right? We talked about symmetric distributions and how the mean is equal to the median is equal to the mode, and that happens right here in the center. And if we go one standard deviation in each direction from that mean, within this area, 68% of all the data value falls. If we go two standard deviations in each direction, then 95% of the data values fall in that area. And if we go out, 99.7% of the data falls within these three standard deviations. That's what that empirical rule says. So if you think about this second standard deviation, two standard deviations away from the mean, we said 95% of all data values fall there. So that means only 5% fall outside of two standard deviations. If you were betting money on reaching into a bag full of data values and pulling one out, wouldn't you bet on pulling out a value within two standard deviations? Because it's 95% of the time you're going to get one of those values. That means that anything that's outside of two standard deviations is considered unusual. Not impossible, but unusual. And with the three standard deviations being 99.7%, Anything beyond a three standard deviations of the mean would be considered highly unusual. And when we say highly unusual, what we're really saying is suspicious. So if people were consistently getting values that fell that far away from the mean, then that tells us that there's a problem somewhere. And it tells us that either somebody's lying or that calculations that were computing the mean were off in the first place. Because you might find a value outside every once in a while, but to find them consistently out there means there's an issue. So let's look at an example. The length of newborn babies is normally distributed with an average length of 19 inches and a standard deviation of 0.75 inches. What percentage of babies is born between 17.5 and 19.75 inches long? Make a sketch of the distribution. That sketch will help us once we know that it's a normal distribution, then that tells me it's a bell curve. So let's go ahead and draw a bell curve. We'll put 19 inches in the middle because that's where the mean goes. And then we'll use 0.75 as our standard deviation. So this is what that graph would look like. You'll see the 19 right in the middle, and then we go in units of 0.75. So one standard deviation takes me to 19.75 on the right and 18.25 on the left. Two standard deviations, so we go 0.75 twice, that's 1.5 to the right gives us 20.5. 1.5 to the left gives me 17.5. And then another 0.75 in each direction to get me to 16.75 and 21.25. So those are our 0.75 iterations along the x-axis. And the question asked us what percentage of babies was born between 17.5 and 19.75 inches. So those are right here and we're just going to add up these percentages. So to get from 17.5 to 19.75 we see the 13.5 percent, a 34 percent, and a 34 percent because it's these three regions put together. So when we add those up, we get 81.5%.
So 81.5% of newborn babies are between 17.5 and 19.75 inches. So that's how we can use the empirical rule to answer a question. Then we can talk about standard deviation of grouped data. So when you have several repeated data values, you can use the frequency of each data value in a formula to help you find the standard deviation. If you think back to that standard deviation problem that we did earlier in this section, we had several values that repeated because we got the same deviations, and when we squared, we got the same squares. What this says is that we can just find those deviations one time and then square it one time, but multiply by the frequency. That way, if that same thing happened 12 times, you do the computation once and you multiply it by 12 to get the sum of what it would be 12 times. So this formula is S equals the square root of the sum of X minus X bar squared, that's the deviations squared, times its frequency divided by lowercase n minus one. So we have a problem here. I love this problem because I can just imagine sending students out to do this and how many doors would get slammed in front of their faces. 40 households were surveyed as to the number of eggs in the refrigerators. The results are listed below. Find the sample mean and sample standard deviation. So imagine knocking on the door. Hi, I'm here taking a survey. Could you please tell me how many eggs you have in your refrigerator right now? And wham, that door gets slammed right in your face. But you finally managed to get 40 households to give you their number and you get this data set. So we get 3, 8, 7, 0, 10, 3, 12, 7, 9, 8, 4, 1, 3, 11, 4, 15, 8, 11, 9, 7, 7, 12, 5, 6, 10, 9, 7, 6, 12, 6, 14, 6, 3, 0, 7, 10, 5, 3, 9, 3. Those are the 40 values that you get. You'll notice that there's several repeated values. So for instance, if I came up to this array of data, here's a 7, here's another 7, here's another 7, and another 7, and another 7, and another 7. Why would I want to find that particular deviation six different times? Why not just find the deviation once, and then square it once? and multiply by six. That's what this process is about. So first I'm gonna go ahead and find the mean. We're gonna add up all these data values. They add up to 280. And so 280 divided by 40 is seven. So we have an average of seven eggs per refrigerator. So you'll notice that these means have come out really nicely in the problems that we've done in this section. Now on the homework, they don't always come out so nicely, but I make a promise to you on any exam or quiz, I'm going to have a nice mean whenever you have to compute a variance or a standard deviation. And that's because if your mean is a decimal and then you're trying to build one of these tables, it can really, really make the whole calculation much more difficult. So we have our mean of seven. I'm gonna build a table. This table is gonna be a little bit different than the table we had before because it's also gonna incorporate frequency. If you look back at those 40 numbers, you'll notice that they range from zero to 15, but there's a few that are missing. For instance, none of the 40 households reported that they had two eggs. And also none of them had 13 eggs. So we've got zero, one, three, four, five, six, seven, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 14, and 15. Then the frequencies for each one of those. So 0 happened twice. 1 happened once. 3 happened 6 times. 4 happened twice. 5 happened twice. 6 happened 4 times. 7 happened 6 times. 8 happened 3 times. 9 happened 4 times, 10 happened 3 times, 
11 happened twice, 12 happened three times, 14 happened once, and 15 happened once. Now we've added in some columns in this table. One is for x times f, one is for x minus x bar, the deviation, one is for x minus x bar squared, the square of the deviation, and then one is for x minus x bar squared times f, because we have to multiply by frequency when we're doing this process. That x times f thing we haven't talked about. Let's go ahead and compute those values, and then we'll talk about what it's useful for. So we're going to just take every data value and multiply it by the frequency. So 0 times 2 is 0. 1 times 1 is 1. 3 times 6 is 18. 4 times 2 is 8. 5 times 2 is 10. 6 times 4 is 24. 7 times 6 is 42. 8 times 3 is 24. 9 times 4 is 36. 10 times 3 is 30. 11 times 2 is 22. 12 times 3 is 36. 14 times 1 is 14. And 15 times 1 is 15. Now, if I was to add these numbers up, they add up to 280. And if I divided by the 40 data values that we have, that would give us the average of 7. So if we hadn't yet computed the sample mean, we could use an x times f, add them all up, and divide by the total number of entries to get that mean. So we had already actually done the mean in this problem, but I wanted to show you the column that you can add to the table that can actually help you find the mean this way. Now let's compute our deviations like we would in any other problem. We said that the mean was 7. So 0 minus 7 is negative 7. 1 minus 7 is negative 6. 3 minus 7 is negative 4. 4 minus 7 is negative 3. 5 minus 7 is negative 2. 6 minus 7 is negative 1. 7 minus 7 is 0. 8 minus 7 is 1. 9 minus 7 is 2. 10 minus 7 is 3. 11 minus 7 is 4. 12 minus 7 is 5. 14 minus 7 is 7. And 15 minus 7 is 8. So now we have all of our deviations. Then we can square those deviations. Negative 7 squared is 49. Negative 6 squared is 36. Negative 4 squared is 16. Negative 3 squared is 9. Negative 2 squared is 4. Negative 1 squared is 1. 0 squared is 0. 1 squared is 1. 2 squared is 4. 3 squared is 9. 4 squared is 16. 5 squared is 25. 7 squared is 49. 8 squared is 64. So we have all of our different deviations. But those deviations happened multiple times. So the deviation squared of 49 happened twice. So we're going to take each x minus x bar and multiply it times the f. So here we have 49 times 2. And 49 times 2 is 98. In the next row, we have 36 times 1, which is 36. 16 times 6 is 96. 9 times 2 is 18. 4 times 2 is 8. 1 times 4 is 4. 0 times 6 is 0. 1 times 3 is 3. 4 times 4 is 16. 9 times 3 is 27. 16 times 2 is 32. 25 times 3 is 75. 49 times 1 is 49. And 64 times 1 is 64. 
So now we have this column, this very last column. That's where the money is. That's what we need. We're going to go ahead and add up those numbers to help us find the variance and standard deviation. So when we add up all the numbers in that last column, 98 plus 36 plus 96, plus 18 plus 8 plus 4 plus 0, equals 260. 3 plus 16 plus 27 plus 32, plus 75 plus 49 plus 64, equals 266. When we add up the 260 and 266, we get 526. So the standard deviation here is going to be the square root of 526 over 39. The 39 is one less than the size of the sample. The sample was size 40. One less than that is 39. We take our square root of this fraction, again allowing the calculator to do the fractional square root. And we round off to three decimals and get 3.672. So that would be our standard deviation for this egg problem. So the average number of eggs per household was 7 with a standard deviation of 3.672. So that's the average amount by which a randomly chosen data value is expected to vary from the mean by about 3.672. That brings us to an end of section 2.4. Please look on Pearson for your homework. And have a great day.